Great yes. summary. Awesome. Thank you, Maya, for that. So we're moving into the conversation of quality assurance, quality control, and the role that remote monitoring plays in a decentralized uh, arena. So our industry, rightfully so, is incredibly risk averse. We spent a lot of time in previous uh, topics that we've had thus far talking about that. I think one of the more challenging aspects of continuing our collective push to drive this innovation in the clinical trial operations is the fact that we as people, humans, fundamentally, we struggle with change. Some of us struggle a tiny bit, whether because we're more resilient or what have you, we have more support. Some of us struggle a lot. And as a, as a way to open up the conversation in the QAQC arena, I'd like to kick us off by asking, is it more important that we learn how to cope with the complexity of decentralized trials? Or is it more important that we learn to cope with the change, just generally speaking? Um, and by that, I mean, do we cope with the SOPs and the know-hows and the how-tos and the processes, or do we just take a step back and say, this is a painful ch change process? <laughs> how do we cope with the change that the industry is facing, and how do we have a conversation around that? So uh, can I just jump in here? Uh, you asked the best questions, you know. Oh, my gosh. I, like, I'm, I'm reading this. I'm thinking about it. And I say this because, um, you know, a, a bit of an overshare here, but my husband and I have a joke. He, I deal with change very well. He does not. And his family is very known for not dealing with it. They love a good routine. There is nothing like a good routine. And, uh, and so we even joke in the house, even before we had my son, we said change, you know, like this big, scary voice, you know, anytime I was proposing a change to the routine and here lately, we've been singing and watching Frozen for those of you parents of toddlers out there, Frozen too. Yep. Lots of it. And there's a whole song about what you can focus on, right, is the consistency of change. There are some things that will never change, and there are some things that will always change. And I would actually say that from an EQ perspective, this is what you struggle with in compliance. Mm -hmm. Because at least for me, educationally, you know, I'm trained as an attorney, and, and part of that skill set is pivot, 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 pivot. Like you're pivoting with every client, with every situation, with every regulation, no matter if you're in this industry or another. So it's almost like even if you as a person don't subscribe to change well, you're taught, you're trained in your professional mindset. And, and frankly, that's what you're there to navigate is the change. You're there to coordinate, navigate, and stay ahead of the change. You're there to predict the enforcement trend and be one step ahead of it with your procedures and your documentation. So I think there's a very powerful statement to be made about the ability of the industry to stay nimble and change. Now, I will say that with the caveat that as a shout out to the folks who are risk averse, there's good reason for that too, right? We've seen some pretty um, sticky situations. Everyone is moving towards some type of regulatory approval, you know, at the end of their clinical trial life cycle. Um, and so to say that we're just not concerned whatsoever, or we don't feel constrained or out of control, frankly, at times, like we don't control mm -hmm. the situation um, or the frustration of the fact that the regulations maybe don't keep up with the technology and the innovation. And so that, that, you know, square peg round hole feeling, um, yes. I think that factors in. I, so like, I don't think it's all just change. I think it's some of those other rubs layered in the complexity um, of it all. Yeah. Yeah. But I do yeah. think I will say working with everyone from, you know, small sites to huge sites, understandably your small sites do a lot better with change. They're used to it. Yeah. It's endemic for them. They don't have a choice. Yeah. I, I truly think the opportunity in uh, remote monitoring is is huge, and it's, I think it's much much bigger than I think a lot of people realize. I think the the um, the entire monitoring um, process has been built around. There's a site, there's some paper at the sites, some data at the sites, and so in order to access that data, we need to send a human being. So we have to schedule a visit and we review work at that visit. Um, and I think with technology. Um, there's no reason why that work, the, the work product, the data couldn't be available centrally, remotely, right? Like every other industry, but it really opens up new possibilities. So, uh, you know, I, I actually know of a CRO that had a site that was using electronic source. And so they didn't have to go visit, um, but it, their, the process was so rigid that what they did was a pre-scheduled, a remote visit, which basically meant they put on a calendar and they said, we're going to re review subject six, seven, eight, nine. And then they treated it as if the monitor was getting on the plane, but the monitor didn't get on the plane, the monitor just, you know, 
probably went to the home office and and logged it in and, and then logged out and they were done with that visit and they wrote up a visit summary report. But if you stop and think about it, if you had instant access to all the data across all the sites, w- why would you group your reviews every six weeks at a site? It doesn't make any sense. You would be doing continuous monitoring, continuous review, right? So that's the first thing that, that, that changes. Um, and the second thing that changes is why would you have one monitor review the source data, and then one data manager come in and review some other aspects of the data. Why wouldn't you sit there and say, well, data manager, you do the medical coding part of it. Monitor, you do this part of it. Oh, and by the way, maybe we can get a medically trained monitor to look at the medical aspects of it, right? I mean, the most CRAs are not trained to review medical records and and sort of review eligibility decisions. I mean, sort of, you have like one person's, you know, one size fits all, but now you can actually have different different skill sets review different aspects of the visit. So it really opens up a whole new workflow. And I don't think anybody has really mastered that or developed that or figured that out. But I think there can be huge potential for any CRO that figures out what that process looks like. Well, and I think there's like a few details here where, you know, if we're not careful, we'll get in our own way in this department. So I think there's a few things. First of all, you know, again, let's look at the system we had in our pre-2020 world of the monitor comes to the site. Well, if you are working with really large pharmaceutical sponsors, chances are that monitor is actually a contractor who's never stepped foot inside the pharmaceutical company and also doesn't know your site. And I don't know about, about you guys, but my worst experiences, some of which could fill a book of just awkward, never saw this coming, never dealt with it again, you know, one-off examples of horrific situations have been contract monitors. And frankly, that's a really bad spot for the sponsor because, you know, I'm the one at the site calling the sponsor up going, your monitor's out of control. Um, They're being unprofessional in my site, at my location, right? I have certain things they have to abide by to be on my property. And of course the sponsor's embarrassed. They're not happy about that, but it's a contractor. It's, and so they're so far removed, right? They don't even know what's happening. So it's not as if that setup was working. And I'm not saying everyone utilized that, but it's not like that was a perfect setup, having someone come on site. In fact, there were just as many problems. The other thing where I saw at the beginning of this, and I know Raymond and I talked about it, is this idea that uploading a PDF is remote monitoring or remote <laughs> source. Okay, no. Um, that that's not, it, it might be a hybrid or what you're using as patchwork to get by. And I understand and respect that, but that's not actually right. Like bootstrap, Hey, all in, but that's not actually remote. Right. And so, um, you know, and you start to have extra time operations and pieces when you move into what truly is remote. The third piece that I would warn about in terms of truly remote is even once you get sites to 100% get on board with a truly remote technology that actually enables the monitoring Raymond's talking about, which is awesome, by the way. What ends up happening is when you have any type of organized auditing agency, like say like a cooperative group in oncology, those auditors, even though they're not gonna travel to your site, they do remote auditing 24 seven, that's all they do, right? They're very well trained at doing this at a remote arm's length, they know what you're doing, they know the protocol, the individual site that may have nothing to do with your research team controls the system and they control who has access to the system. So that Mm -hmm. poor auditor who is auditing remotely has to practically like, you know, give their social security number, the name of their firstborn child, you know, to get in at each and every site and each one's going to be different. So Mm -hmm. that creates another, right? So like, even once we get to the point where people are doing the remote monitoring, they really have the tech, we're over this, we have to travel and be at the site. Like we've moved all the way past that. You still have this hiccup with privacy and lack of a standardization of what you will provide, you know, or what an auditor has to do to get their access point and what that looks like. Um, So just food for thought. I don't wanna like shoot it out of the park because I think the remote monitoring is so smart. I, I just don't know why we weren't doing more of it before it seems, you know, it's like the way I feel about my consulting work. I've never traveled for all my clients. There's no need for that. There never was. Even in 1980s, you know, when my company was founded, the telephone worked Um, and Zoom Zoom wasn't invented in 2020, you know? So I think that we have the opportunity. I just think we've, we've stumbled. We've stumbled hard and, and each, each layer has brought new complications and we're just, we're not nailing this one. 
even after 2020, we have not nailed this one. And I, I don't know that there's any easy way to do it. Maya? I actually have one thing that I wanted to add to what Evie said, and like Raymond. Actually, Raymond touched upon it. It was about the heroes. I think the big challenge when it comes to remote monitoring is that the, is the fact that CROs have to change their business model. They do. Because if you look at how they're making money, most of their money, is actually through sending monitors at the site. The majority of the money they're making is per, per, per visit. Actually, it's a, it's a long story because even patient recruitment suffers from that. We all have heard of the booster visits. I'm not saying that's not working, so that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that like pushing for more visits to the site is what brings more revenue to the zero. So moving away from this model opens up a big hole kind of in the business model of these clinical research organizations. Now they have to embrace technologies. They have to become tech companies in a way, and it's a challenge for them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think that maybe we, we have to give them some time to kind of embrace what's happening out there. And like, like trainers say, um, and like uh, big guys, what they say, no, pa no pain, no gain, right? right? So they'll feel, feel the pain for a while, but eventually remote monitoring is the way. Because Edie said something also that I wanted to comment. She said about something about contracted um, series, like contracts and monitors, and that sometimes they're not so, as engaged as other like monitors. I think that's across the board. I mean, yes. of course, some CRAs are brilliant yes. and they're super engaged and they'll build a very strong connection. And that's why the CRA role has been traditionally so popular. But yes. let's, let's be honest, like we are so way advanced with technologies and a lot of the CRA's uh, work is about repeatable things that can be automated in the end of the day. So maybe we should also rethink their role in yeah. focusing on building the relationship, on yeah. being concierge to the site in a way. Yeah. And yeah, kind of like, so two things, basically, rethinking the CRO business model and then the role of the CRA. Absolutely. And I think there's definitely a role for CRAs. Um, and I definitely think there's role for relationship building. And I think there's roles for on-site visits and in-person meetings strategically along the way for the trial because that human yep. relationships is, is critical. So I think the good news is with the remote monitoring and more technology and more errors being prevented from the beginning because it's because of the edit checks with technology, um, you can get rid of a lot of the rote work that essentially you're overpaying for um, and then leverage the interpersonal skills uh, of the monitors. Um, but it, it get, you, you do have to rethink the whole business model and it's going to probably end up with a lower revenue amount, hopefully a higher margin, mm. more nimble, maybe fewer people, but uh, more clearly defined skill sets uh, that you can go out and potentially a great competitive advantage if you can be the first to, to nail it. Um, but I understand, you know, that's a big ask <laughs> uh, for any company to do that. So I could see why it, uh, I'm not even sure we're going to get there with this pandemic, honestly, because I, I see a lot of CROs that the, the vibes I'm getting from, uh, from what I'm hearing is that I think a lot of CROs are saying, oh, vaccine right around the corner. Yep. And, uh, and by we'll July, back, we'll be back. back on That's what I was yeah. going to say is I'm hearing back to it, back to it, back yeah. to it, back to yeah. it. And yeah. and I think it's, you know, like what you said, Raymond, there's there's room for everything, right? Like there's there's layers here. Like it doesn't have to be all in, all mm. out. Like there's something to be said for every now and then actually touching down at a site as the sponsor or as the CRO, even if it's just like you said, for the human connection, like, hey, we just exactly. want to say you're doing a great job. Yeah, we just, yeah. We just want to pat you on the back in person. But um, you're, you're talking on a, on a very specific skill set, yeah. right, Edie? And, and Raymond, Raymond said, you got to rethink about the skill sets that the CRAs are bringing to the table. One of my favorite quotes is, if you want to build a new house, don't bring bricks from your old one that fell apart. And so, so that's really the direction that we're going with the decentralized trials. And one of the other questions that I had for you three uh, panelists is at the site level, what I've observed in my time operating as a study coordinator in my various roles at the site level specifically, what I see is this, this, um, this culture of having brilliant ideas for improving clinical trial operations, or you see some folks that have really wonderful ideas. And then we sell ourselves short because then we think about regulatory. Right. And then we think to ourselves, OK, uh, this how are we going to get this through our organization's uh, compliance officer? How are we going to go to our manager and ask about like how we can amend the SOP? Right. So sometimes it is a true regulatory burden. Sometimes the 
sheer perception of the regulatory burden is enough of a deterrent to say, no, nope, forget it. It's much easier for me to just buckle down and have the study court, you know, the study monitoring visit and just whatever, I'm, I won't deal with it. And so my question for you all uh, as panelists is, uh, how do we as an industry encourage and drive this change forward while also being mindful of the common thread that regulatory needs to play in the framework of all of it? So I'm guessing I'm up. Um, <laughs> I was waiting for your fashion to come in. <laughs> I'm like, where are my double horns when I need it? You know, I was just talking about this earlier today, actually, about, uh, you know, uh, this self-awareness that comes with being in regulatory and compliance. Like if this is going to be your chosen field and your chosen space, um, you know, it's a completely different conversation when you're self-aware enough to say like, yeah, we got to talk about FDA regulations for the next hour. It's going to be dry. I suggest everyone go get some caffeine. We're going to we're going to stand up from time to time to make sure we're still awake, right? If you come in and you rebrand it and you own it in that regard, um, I think it takes on a very different life in your organization. And that's where I would argue, you know, you really want to see sites come alive um, in the sense of owning their own regulatory and processes. When I work with clients, I'm really big about that. And I think that you know, I, I don't ever want someone to see regulatory as a constraint. It is a necessary evil because of where we have come from, right? And because of what we have experienced, um, it, is, it is intended to be a summation of our experiences so we don't stumble yet again in areas that clearly we couldn't self-police ourselves out of, okay? But that doesn't mean that those of us who ride the regulatory bus, um, you know, are all straight-laced and will, unwilling to think outside the box. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, and, and some of this is, is my personality, but some of it is truly learned of, you know, how can we as regulation or regulatory affairs people sit down at the site level and say, tell me what you want to do. Stop thinking about what you're allowed to do or what you think you're allowed to do. I'm not even going to propose anything or say yes or no or smile or not or give you any tell, right? I just want you to tell me what you want to do. You have a magic wand in this moment. Give me what you want to do. And then start talking about, okay, all right, so the goal here is this. So we could do this and this. This might not work quite like that, but let me look into that. And you start piecing it together because the reality is the end of the day goal here is to reach the patient, right? And so why wouldn't we get as creative as we could? And if you come from the regulator's mindset as a lawyer, you know that actually there's a very intentional reason that those regulations aren't written with specificity. And as much as we get really annoyed at an agency like say the FDA, because they come out and make broad statements. And I know Maya and I have talked about this. They come out and make broad statements like, you know, we encourage decentralized trials, but they don't give you a playbook, right? Yeah. And, and, and we were talking about this the other day, Maya, and I, man, it has been on my mind so much since then. It's like, seriously, all, I was like talking to myself in the shower about it um, because it's true, right? It's absolutely true that they don't come out and give you a playbook. And most of your sites, that's what they want. They want to do this right. There's really very few just outright bad actors out there. Most of the time it's, I didn't know what I didn't know. I stumbled, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm human. No one told me to do it this way. And when you're talking about biomedical research, because they do dabble in social behavioral as well. I mean, this is a heavily regulated industry. People are, they understand that there are rules. They understand that there are really bad examples. And that's why we've arrived in regulation. Okay. So it's not so much that they don't want to subscribe. It's that they don't have the playbook. Here's the other side of that coin from the regulator's perspective. We tell you in a written format exactly what to do. Then we bind you. We actually totally cuff you because then there will be no flexibility. So there is an intention and a reason why some of our regulations are written very openly. And I would say, encourage regulatory flexibility. I'm not saying bend the rules, let me be very clear. I am saying as long as our, our, we are focused on the true intention of the regulation and where it is born from, right? Patient safety, innovation, Obviously now we have an incredible focus on reaching populations we're not reaching because of the disparity it causes on so many levels. There, there is something to be said for as long as whatever you put together in your QAQC mechanisms, you know, it's kind of like what I tell my clients, could you stand in front of an FDA auditor and rationalize what you did? Yeah. Could you explain to them, I wrote this SOP, we altered it with this note to file. We had to pivot very quickly because 2020 
happened, right? We got shut down. So then we moved to this process, which we documented this way. We did this instead of this because we thought it was safer for the patient. And if, as long as you can play that whole scenario out, it doesn't yeah. mean they won't come back and say, well, in hindsight, we think you should have done it this way as opposed to that way. But overarchingly, that's not where you're going to get in trouble. Where you're going to get in trouble is where you had no rationale. You had no plan. You knew you had to have a mechanism and you didn't. So that's where I would say most of us in regulatory, man, we're fired up this year. We yeah. love seeing this flexibility. And if you really read the tea leaves with the FDA, um, obviously I spend more time with FDA than EMA, but I'm, I'm hearing it from, from the EU as well. If you read the tea leaves, they're basically saying, finally, we have a test case, right? Yes. Like we were just waiting for someone to like take us up on it. Now we have it. Now we can begin that, that process of almost the scientific method on our process, yes. right? We're going to try some things that aren't going to work. And we're going to fail. We're going to figure that out when we're going to fail and we're going to come back, right? And so there's something to be said for COVID forced the test case. Yes. No one wanted to take the risk. And again, I see it on both sides. I get it. The FDA can't tell you exactly how to do it. And they need you to do it. Move. And then they audit it. <laughs> the sites don't want to do it and then get audited. Yep. I mean, like this is not an easy solution or fix. But I do think that's what 2020 brings to the table. Edie, you, it gave us the test. Case. You always bring some of the most colorful contacts <laughs> for regulatory and otherwise dull and scary topic. And so I <laughs> so appreciate and love you for that. Um, in the best interest of time, a rapid fire round, if you will, for any last minute thoughts or comments that Maya or Raymond, you may want to add to what we, we discussed here in, on the conversation. Just wanted to add um, to what Edie said because we've been discussing yeah. this topic for quite some time. But I think that because she touched upon mainly the fear that it's at the site with being compliant and the regulatory, but I think it's a chain of fear. And the biggest, um, let's say, uh, like stakeholder that has the most to lose actually is in the end of the day, the sponsor. Yes. So the sponsor would put a pressure on the side how much they would do or not do. And that's another story where we were, we're going to touch upon that in the leadership uh, topic, uh, basically who should be leading the innovation yes. and the change. But I think that the sponsor would not only fear regulators, but they would also fear the sponsors, whether they will be okay and open open to do something else, even if it's better for patients. But I totally get also the sponsors because they have the most like fun they've food. got skin in the game. I mean they've yeah, got they millions have a lot of skin in the game, especially in some of like the later stages, like the later oh, yes. They, they've invested a lot of money and they're just uh, like before approval. So they want to make sure that they will get the approval. Yeah. So it's yeah. like really the chicken in the egg here because they want to make sure that the regulators will give them the green light. Just do this. And we, we if you do this, yes, then right. uh, like we will prove you. But here is one thing. Um, so it's true that the centralized clinical trials, it's not a new area. It's not since COVID. It's way before that. Yes. So I know from pharma companies what they've been doing, like not all of them, but one of the tricks that they've been doing in order to kind of taste the field, taste the waters basically, is having multiple arms. And like the, the most arms that they would submit this data to the to the regulatory was actually to um, like the, the traditional type of clinical trial. And there would be one arm, maybe in one or two countries with some kind of like different, uh, like um, different setup, the centralized type of setup, let's say, so that they can actually learn from the experience with the patients, with the sites, mm. and also possibly get feedback on the regulatory. Mm. These, of, these of course are mainly the big pharmas because they are the ones to have the money to experiment. But I think that it will be great if this pharma come back to the industry and share these insights and the results because that will boost not only from regulatories uh, because they don't have also that much experience with the centralized. Right. Uh, regulatory bodies, but also it will boost um, adoption among CROs and among sites because they're afraid of like putting this up front of the sponsors because they know how afraid they are. But my question, yes. so here's a question for you on that, because I agree a thousand percent. My question to you and to the group is then, do you think that particular sponsor who was the one who put their neck out there, who spent yeah. the money and the resources, and I can get behind this, right? Mm hmm is gonna say, yeah, you know what? We get to profit off that for a minute before we share all the secrets. They don't like to share these saying, results. <laughs> we're not saying on down the line right. that it's not all gonna be in the public domain, right. but at least for the first year or two, you know what? Yeah. We took the risk, right, right, we spent right. that money, we have a right. right. So, I mean- That's great, that's great fuel for the leadership conversation about how to yeah. drive the innovation. Right. 
And so, you know, with that, I think we're, we're, we're at a perfect uh, juncture to segue into the regulatory compliance and really where the rubber meets the road in operationalizing a lot of the regulatory framework for actually doing things and actually executing on trials. So with that, I think we're at a good stopping point for transitioning into the regulatory compliance section of our series. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you.